Hi, my name is Emily and uh, welcome to another edition to Graph CMS Talks. Today I'm speaking with Kate from Honeypot and she is our events team lead um, at Honeypot. So Kate, I'll let you just give a quick introduction to yourself and a little bit of a brief history of your time at Honeypot. Sure. Hi, Emily. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Kate, and uh, I'm doing events for more than six years. But at Honeypot, I'm already working as events team lead for three years. And uh, Honeypot itself, to give you some context, is the company that operates both in the tech recruitment, so working with recruiters, but as well as with developers who would love to find their ideal job. So since the beginning, uh, I was doing events for both developers and both recruiters in all the countries that we were presented. So far, it's Germany, Netherlands, Austria, and Spain. Uh, since the beginning of pandemic in 2020, all events and everything else turned online. And uh, for me, it was quite a new format. But so far, we managed to organize a series of events on both sides. So we're catching up with everyone online. Super cool. Yeah, I can imagine working with events in this year has been a chaotic but exciting new journey. So, um, oh yes, M mostly chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's frank, definitely. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll just kind of dive into this discussion. So, um, first, our, my first question for you is: How does your team create a balance between creating events for gr greater brand awareness versus just um, with the intention of converting? Um, yeah. That's yeah. That's always a good question. So, whenever you check the marketing funnel, there is the line of brand awareness, the acquisition, the consideration, and of course the moment of uh, like the possible execution. Um, I would say in our company we have a bit like, for example, events are more around awareness and acquisition. So the moment when oh sorry, the awareness and consideration. So it's more about people to know about the company to learn to distinguish from the competitors. And overall, when we perform in the market of recruiters, um, we can behave as the client-oriented company. But whenever we behave in the market of developers, we meet a lot of bias. That's why through events, we can educate that like, we are not recruiters per se, but we can help you to find a job. We are not headhunters. But yes, of course, there are sometimes headhunters out there who might use similar techniques. But mm. at the same time, we're trying to distinguish. So I would say the events uh, per se are more for awareness, so for branding. Mm. But we have some other type of content. For instance, uh, the videos or uh, the articles, or which which are uh, going further off the marketing channel. So not only hey, by the way, we have these articles, but by the way, these articles can help you. And if you sign up with, uh, on the platform, we can help you even further. Mm. Um, so I would say then the brand, like different types of content work for different types of uh, goals. And mm -hmm. events usually are for awareness, unless it's a job fair. But usually we didn't run job fairs. It's not our priority. Yeah, that makes sense. And so when you're thinking about how to create events, what considerations do you make uh, when trying to create new events or new content to make sure that these new initiatives are actually engaging to the community? Yeah, um, there are different ways. And I remember three years ago when I just joined, and of course I was not doing events from the very beginning, but I was joining the events that my colleagues were already creating, uh, and how they did it back then. They were going to different meetups back then they mm. were offline, uh, and just talking to people or finding some um, similarities, like, okay, we're interested in cutting edge technology. Apparently, you one of the ambassadors, one of the evangelists of this new technology. Back then, for us, it was GraphQL. And at first, it was a meetup together, interest from our side, uh, the great wheel from the other side to share the knowledge further, to have mm -hmm. the stage. And later on, it actually ended up in the conference about GraphQL. At the same time, it's not the stack that we ever used in our company, mm -hmm. but because we were interested in something modern and something new and something that can help quicker and faster, literally just from talking to people, that's how it ends up. That's like one of the ways. Another one, uh, of course, getting some feedback and ideally from people who are using your product. Mm -hmm. So if we, like, we always say that in top five of priorities from both sides, like how many developers and how many um, 
uh, demand from the company there is. It's usually, for example, front end. Mm -hmm. So if it's about front end, I'm just checking for latest news, something we could have helped around. At the same time, we're not trying to go to the field where we are not uh, having a lot of knowledge. So if we're not JavaScript engineers, I might have a few colleagues, but they might not be such speakers as there are some people out there. Yeah. We'd rather provide either the stage or the possibility to talk, or maybe find the solution around career as a front-end developer. What is it to be a front-end developer in Berlin? That's something that we actually know about because we are in touch with quite many companies who hire front-end developers in Germany, as well yeah. as with quite many developers who already are in Berlin. So then trying to find, like to hear from people what they would be interested, uh, to see like where the supply demand is going through the company and yeah. actually find, like marry these two ideas somewhere in between where our knowledge could be, but at the same time where demand is. Because if we would create about, uh, if we are going to create events only about cutting edge technology, they are not the most popular on our um, platform. There are some, but it's not top five or not even top 10. Yeah. We would go too niche and uh, it would not for, work for us. But time to time, it's nice, as well as time to time to go with the crowd, especially yeah. with your crowd. Yeah, definitely. That's also something we've seen at Graph CMS is like trying to find the balance between um, going super niche for something that our developers will enjoy versus something that's a little bit more broad that will get a greater audience and people, um, a kind of a broader audience will find it engaging rather than just maybe our, one of our developers will like to do this one project. Um, and so you touched on this a little bit, um, but what is your process for selecting speakers and how do you and your team set up a successful community event? Yeah, so as I mentioned a bit earlier as well, we run not only events, but some articles or a video documentary. Mm -hmm. Also, one of my colleagues is working on the uh, on kicking off the podcast series and uh, how we, so since we are in touch with people who could fit uh, mm -hmm. in, like who can write an article, who could be a speaker, who could be a hero of the video. That's sometimes how we actually do that, like the holistic approach. Mm -hmm. For instance, one of my colleagues had a great idea about doing documentaries about some tech stacks. Mm -hmm. One of the latest videos we released was about you. It was in February, 2020. Mm -hmm. And since he was in touch so much with the view community, he would already know some people in this community and some questions and some topics. So later on, we actually had a few articles around this and even an event. Uh, if one of, whenever it was going from my side, I would be asking, I would be checking my network. I would be checking network of my colleagues. And later mm -hmm. on, uh, there are some developers who are using our platform that was like in the very beginning. And later on, we would just be asking either, uh, asking the crowd like, hey guys, here's our meetup group, a thousand people, subscribers. Mm -hmm. uh, we're thinking about this direction for the next talk. Would you be interested to speak? Or actually just asking some previous speakers. Yeah. Um, of course, whenever you never did the event before, you might not have a very extended network. Or literally, you just go into the very new direction and at least you have a big network, but no one in this field. What I would do, I would just check some blog posts or um, any major event, and nowadays it's online events, with a list of speakers, maybe check videos or even attend one or two to mm. see, to hear, um, is the speaker very formal or more informal and depends of course what kind of company you are, it could be one style or another, is it similar to what you're thinking and actually then reaching out to these people yourself. So uh, of course some people like, I don't know, Guy Kawasaki who is one of the major evangelists in HR in the world might be a bit unresponsive, so mm. I would not think that far, but I think it's fine to aim for some people who might be still well known, but if there is a match between your idea and what kind of ideas this person shares, you would be surprised how responsive people are. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, don't reach out just to one person and sit back and relax and <laughs> wait. Uh, reach out to several, but just don't promise like, hey, we will feature your obligatory. Maybe you will have a talk and you'll see like, it's a great person, amazing professional, it's just not a match. I can't yeah. afford it. It's a match. It's not a match anymore. And it might be from the other side as well. But you do have a connection, and this person can recommend you some people in the field who will be a better match for both. Yeah. So uh, just to wrap up here, uh, use your network. Um, ask previous speakers. Ask colleagues. 
uh, check different blog posts, people who write articles on Medium or somewhere else, check the conferences, attended conferences, listen to people and reach out to them via maybe LinkedIn or Medium or GitHub or Twitter, whatever social media they kept open uh, to be reached out to. Yeah, definitely. And I've also found this as well of like, if you are open and you are excited about what their topic is and they are excited about it based on, you know, if they've written a blog post or something like that, then people usually are at least very responsive. And if they don't have the time to do it, can often recommend you other great people that could be a good Absolutely. match for your event. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so going off of that, so do you think that community content or events um, serves better as evergreen content, or do you think that it serves more as a snapshot in time? Uh, before, again, pandemic somehow changed my vision as well, you know, yeah. to what was before and what <laughs> is from now. So before March 2020, I would say it should be more evergreen. Mm. And I do think mostly it should be evergreen uh, content. But what we noticed for some events uh, that we were running with our community, for instance, with pandemic news were changing, okay, maybe sometimes not daily, but weekly. Mm. Uh, and the information we had about possibility of relocation in September was different from relocation in, um, in June. Yeah. So like, th th these two moments are really drastically different. Mm. And of course, I would say the majority of content should be more evergreen, like, for us, it is about how to submit for the blue card in Germany. Usually yes. it's pretty the same, and you can change some little things if every year they change the fee, but that's mm. a really minor change. Or how to find a house in Berlin, or uh, how to relocate to Austria. Uh, what is it to live as a developer in Netherlands? Yeah. Uh, at the same time, when we run events, some events were very much about what is happening right now, right mm. here. And uh, the format was also different. For example, the format that we use now, uh, it's interview or the fireside chat. So you pose the questions, I answer, we could be vice versa. But we don't have other people here who could uh, just ask questions right away and I could have answered them and it would be maybe helpful for really right now, right here. Yeah. But the format that we use for these kind of events, which are not evergreen, but more uh, like the TikTok of the moment, is Q&A. Literally, we had as a person who has knowledge, maybe one or two. We had a person who is a moderator, and the moderator prepared some questions, some prompts. We opened at the registration the possibility to ask the question, but mm -hmm. we also gave the possibility to ask questions during the event itself. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, in June, some people were like, okay, my country is semi-open towards Netherlands, can I relocate? And then that was the answer. Most probably in a few months, it was not possible anymore, but the person needed to know back then at the moment when he or she was asking. Yeah. So I would say evergreen would be my priority, but I would not be afraid or not, like I wouldn't, I would spend some time on creating content, especially events, but with particular formats for something that can, that will be relevant for a very short time, like a month or maybe even a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, we get actually quite a lot of interest and we saw like a spike of interest in the topic of relocation back in June because everybody was worried. Can yeah. they relocate? Can they find a job still? Or everybody is just like not people, no one is hiring. So yeah. these events were like guys come down or girls as well. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Some companies are open to hire you and you will start working remote from your own uh, office, so from your own home in your country. Yeah. And that was the moment to just have this dialogue, but everything else we were producing was more evergreen. Yeah, kind of to give everyone a breather and a little bit of anxiety release, like everything yeah. is okay, don't worry, someone is taking care of you, even That's if true. it's in a different country sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so how do you work to make sure that the content that you're creating um, is, again, engaging and relevant and you kind of touched on this with being uh, reactive to what's going on in the world, but um, are there other specific things that you do? There were some experiments um, that we didn't know will it will it be successful or no, mm. and I will I will go a bit in depth in detail in, in a few seconds. And of course, there is a moment when you see the pattern, what kind of articles or events or something like that people are, are mostly engaging with. 
because out of all of my events, I can say uh, what kind of topics performed their best and what kind mm. of topics were not really performing well. Uh, but even if they performed the best, it doesn't mean that we get the same results as uh, from the events that were not performing well, because maybe their awareness were bigger, mm. but we had less people engaging with the content later on, less people going to the website, less people signing up at the platform if it was the goal. At the mm. same time, the, uh, at the event where we didn't have 300 sign-ups, but we had, I don't know, 50 sign-ups, maybe these people were more engaged. So fr from here, I would also go kind of like, what, what is the goal? Mm. Um, but if there is no particular goal, I would think like, okay, what kind of topics actually my audience is interacting the most? And you can ask your audience, you can check their clicks or you can put the UTM links and see from which, I don't know, articles or posts uh, in your LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook, or any other social media or anything like that they're coming from. And you say like, mm -hmm. okay, apparently they're very much interested in junior uh, positions. Yeah. So how could I talk more about this thing? Apparently not senior, but junior. Yeah. Um, and in terms of experiment that I mentioned in the beginning, so a few years back when I joined the company, uh, it was a company of 20 people. Now we have 100. And of course, when it was 20 people, every person counted. And usually every person, as it's quite common for startups, did a bunch of jobs. Yeah. So um, in marketing, we didn't have anyone uh, who was focusing on videos, but that was the idea of our CEO, of mm -hmm. our co-founder, Emma, back then. And at some point, we hired my colleague, um, Josiah, who's a videographer. And he was doing some videos in terms of employer branding for companies. Mm -hmm. But both of them, Mamman and Jaya, had an idea like, okay, uh, that's employer branding videos, something that is less evergreen actually, more, you know, helping to maintain these great, great relations with companies. Is there something else we could have do in terms of video, especially since Josiah is experienced in that? Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, he's like, yeah, maybe I should do the documentary about the text test. Uh, these mm -hmm. people are still alive, they are still here, it's experiment, I don't know how much money it will take, how much attention it will bring, but I'm interested in the topic, these people are still there, we're in touch with these people. So the very first documentary was 12 minutes, mm -hmm. it was about Elixir, Elixir is something that we use on the platform, so some of my colleagues from the tech uh, team, they knew these people, or they even run the events in mm -hmm. uh, countries, in cities that they were based. And all of a sudden it, it got great attention, a lot of people were like, wow, nice, I know now, the yeah. story, what people behind this think about it. It was the first documentary. Yeah. Then there, is, there was a documentary about a different set, and about, then the group of GraphQL, then about you. And for you, it was 45 minutes. We presented at one of the biggest U um, conferences in Europe. It was yeah. in Amsterdam View Conference with 3,000 people. Um, it was uh, for that Josiah, with his video team nowadays, flew to countries, uh, to states, to China, to be in touch with people who actually were behind the view and not only doing, I don't know, Skype call. And yeah. of course, back then, it was fine to travel and it was fine to uh, be at someone's house, not spending two weeks in quarantine. Right. Uh, but that was experiment in the very beginning. Of course, not all experiments end up in this, uh, yeah, in this kind of work or in this kind of volume later on. But for the very first um, video, I think he didn't spend much money, not more than there we would spend on performance, for example. Mm -hmm. And definitely he was still doing some other side projects. He, it just happened during summer when everybody's usually going on holiday. Mm -hmm. It was possible to you know, spend more time on a particular project. Yeah. So some experiments didn't work out, but you just need to be fair. Uh, you just need to be honest about like, okay, I gave it a try. I had a boss. Yeah. We see what kind of results, am I fine with these results? Maybe no. Do they help my core business? Maybe now I need to focus more on core business. Okay, let's just keep it in backlog. Let's just keep it frozen. Yeah, I think that's one of the coolest things about working with a really small and agile team is you get a chance to really try a lot of these experiments. And because everyone is used to doing more than one job or maybe what is exactly on their job description, people are way more engaged in trying to okay, this is a cool experiment, let's get this off the ground, let's try this, and then 
we could evaluate whether or not it worked. If it didn't move on, if not, great, we can go further. And I think that's something so that's really cool with like small and agile teams. Um, uh, we are a bigger team now, still possible, yeah. but you're so right. It's less agile than it used to be when you do, would need to have just one coffee to make mm -hmm. a decision. And now you would need to become a coffee holic right. to make a decision. <laughs> True, but I think the spirit is still there if you're a quickly growing team, you know. Um, so what is the role of uh, kind of zooming out a little bit more? What is the role of creating community content and creating a well-rounded brand? Um, for me, they should be connected. Mm -hmm. um, as it, it will be just very hard to maintain to different directions. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, when we are already apart in B2B business with clients and in B2C EJ developers, that's already the moment where we would need to maintain. Mm. So, for example, in the very beginning when the brand of Honeypot was building up, the idea was like, okay, this market is very much sales oriented, but that's mm -hmm. not how we would love to be. That's mm -hmm. why the name is Honeypot. It's playful. The symbol is the yellow bear. It's fluffy, mm. it's more welcoming, it's more like open, less formal in a way. At the same time, in, on, on slang of developers, Honeypot also has a meaning, so it was a play of four. Um, and that's why we would never really be very much formal in our communication. We would not be behaving as, I don't know, a teenage friend. Still, mm. it's the business and we have quite big companies, enterprises as our clients, and I think it would be a bit weird for them to be in touch with them and uh, say like dude or this yeah. kind of stuff. But uh, we would, as, as well, we would never go to the style of the government. So then the community um, content is very much the mirror of the well-rounded brand. So mm -hmm. if the brand is fluffy and open, semi-formal, semi-informal, then the articles and the videos and uh, everything else is like it's your uh, teammate from your football team. So not like the very high level coach you can't really approach, but maybe your friend who is the coach who yeah. can help you out. And then the tone of voice is like that, the branding, um, the events are about it and not like how to hack the system of enterprises, like how to be, I don't know, how to sell yourself. No, I would yeah. never say this kind of words. It's not really that even if the topic is about like sell yourself, mm -hmm. like how to perform the best in, to, in, to, in the interview, I would really say differently, something like how to find the job you love and yeah. don't worry during the interviews and actually show yourself. But of course I would need to create something shorter than really long phrases I just mentioned. Um, so I would say brand goes first and yeah. from brand you bring some community articles. It would be worth if you do it vice versa, because your brand, your company is the one that often in a way gives you the work, gives you the salary, generates money. Yeah. And because of the business, you can actually execute this experiment and everything else. But yeah, I, I would say that the team that is working on that should be really aligned. It shouldn't be um, product designer creating the product and then a marketing designer trying to absorb. No, they need to be either it's one person or collaboration of two and they all the time in touch. Otherwise, yeah. you would never know where your legs are going while you're mm -hmm. ahead somewhere else and it will not help neither the community content nor the brand and the business itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I totally agree. And I think that's something that, I think with Honeypot, you guys have done a really good job of kind of striking the balance of keeping on tone. Like even if they do kind of do different things if you're on the honeypot website versus on i don't know like your cult.honeypot.io this has a slightly different feel but it's still kind of the same tone in a way um which i think is really amazing that you guys have been able to do that so successfully um great and kate this has been such a great conversation i really enjoyed this especially um the last little bit that you were mentioning about how to build um, community content while still being on brand and what's the balance between that. Um, I'll go ahead and splash up your socials. Um, is there anything that you would like to plug or what's the best way to reach out to you if people want to kind of have more questions or anything like that? Sure. 
Um, first of all, it's super easy to connect with me on LinkedIn. So my name is Victoria Kromina, and uh, mm -hmm. if you can put uh, the link there, uh, yeah, it will be the easiest. I don't have a QR code with me mm -hmm. on the <laughs> on the <card. laughs> um, I'm also quite responsive via email, and it's possible to reach out to me either e either via my company mail, ek is like Katrina Kromina, ek at honeypot.io, or mm -hmm. even my personal email if you I don't know would love to reach out about the site project then it will be eat.chromina at gmail.com. But LinkedIn would be the easiest way. I check it time to time. Perfect. Great. All right, well, Kate, thank you so much for this conversation, and it's been wonderful yeah. talking to you. Bye. Thank you very much. It's so nice to share some knowledge. I hope it will be helpful. Yeah, I'm absolutely sure it will be.